We have to make sure that the politicians are held accountable. Every administration had the ability to put a ban on asbestos. When it comes to asbestos, it really is about power, money, uh, and politics. Welcome, Mike. Thank you very much. Um, I have a limited amount of time, as we all do, and I have a few things that I'd like to make sure that you take with you um, in regard to what, what should be done uh, about diagnosing and treating asbestos-related diseases. First, let me talk to you about the term asbestosis. You want me to? Oh, OK. Um, it's kind of, kind of a wacky word, if you will, in a way to describe a disease process. We know that lucky strikes cause lung cancer. We don't say this particular patient has lucky strikeosis. We say this person has lung cancer. What, the, without going through a lot more examples like that, or, or we know, for example, uh, that uh, colon cancer is associated with uh, asbestos exposure uh, in its causation by a factor of twofold over a period of years. We don't call the colon cancer um, colon cancerosis. We call, call it a colon, well, a colon cancer. You, know, you get my idea, get my drift what I'm saying here. But the po important thing is, is that that nomenclature of calling something asbestosis um, is defined by the government as about a half a dozen minerals that have been shown in epidemiologic studies to cause the diseases lumped under the overall uh, name of asbestosis. That's a geologic term. We should be moving as a community of persons who are concerned about prolonging the period of time from exposure to uh, manifestation of disease uh, from asbestos. And as fighters in the field, to clean up the nomenclature, instead of using the term asbestosis, we should be saying lung cancer, lung scarring, uh, colon cancer from asbestos. That doesn't mean it comes only from asbestos. It means that it can come from asbestos. So by, I, I teach pulmonary fellows about asbestos-related diseases in my activities of daily living. And they will often say to me, well, this patient can have asbestosis because he was ex not knowingly exposed to asbestos. So it creates sort of a thinking in the medical community that is skewed and prevents the discovery of disease processes and of cures. I want to talk about the most important single factor in preventing workers from dying in the workplace. The most important single factor is the presence of a union contract. Now, I'm lucky enough to be a medical advisor. Thank you. Along with Dr. Markowitz to the insulators union. Now, it's a strange situation when you medically and in terms of the diagnosis of disease processes, when you have more lives saved from asbestos by the efforts of the insulators union and the AFL-CIO over the AMA. The AFL-CIO has saved more lives from asbestos-related diseases than the American Medical Association. There's something wrong with that. Thank you. Um, I want to discuss also part of the nomenclature issues um, on diagnosing and treating asbestos-related diseases. When uh, Dr. Frank and I were in medical school, they taught us that a patient comes in and he has scarring, or she has scarring. We didn't really think in terms of she has scarring at that time. A patient comes in and has scarring on the lungs from asbestos. There's really not much you can do. Tell them to make sure their life insurance policy is paid up make sure that they have uh, health insurance and spend their last happy days with their family. Well, that sort of approach has proliferated throughout the medical community, so that you'll find a reluctance on the part of many physicians to actually treat asbestos-related diseases. The things that I want to stick with you are a couple of terms. Um, you'll hear lung specialists say, well, he has COPD or she has COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, so it can't be from asbestos. Well, the fact of the matter is, asbestos does cause COPD. Dr. Becklake from Canada reported it 40 years ago uh, in the medical literature. And I can tell you as an active clinician, I see it every day in my practice. Now, that having been said, a lot of us who are trained in treating lung diseases in the hospital 
will write COPD. I'm not saying anybody else does this, but I have done it when I'm not, haven't been sure of a diagnosis, but I think it's probably some COPD. So I'll write COPD in the chart, and that's accurate, but it doesn't list the other disease processes the patient might have related to asbestos or related to another toxic exposure. Thusly, when the data gets recorded for retrospective studies of death certificates or hospital records, you come up with a patient having COPD as the cause of death, when in fact it was probably the asbestos. Again, it's, it's a confusion and an obfuscation of the nomenclature. If you want to win this fight that you're in, you have to get synchronous with the terminology, and you have to use the tools of language against the people who would rob you and kill your family members for those same nomenclatures. So I wanted to touch on these things. Um, one other thing that I want to talk about related to mesothelioma is that we are now seeing a group of studies being published that show that people, or rather lab animals that have been exposed to nanotubules and nanoparticles are developing mesothelioma. It's not being called that. It's being called something strange or something different or something new, but that will be part of the mesothelioma fight in the next 10 years. That's pretty much what I wanted to leave you with. Thank you. Uh, just two comments. I'd like to uh, reiterate that Dr. Harbert is a terrific clinician. He's a very good researcher, but he's a wonderful clinician. I've known him for many years, and we've I interacted around patient care, and he's just terrific with individual patients. And just one comment, Mike, about what you said, and I, 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 I think with regard to the COPD example, it illustrates the importance of every physician, every healthcare provider taking a detailed exposure history in order to understand very well what kind of exposures the patient has had, both asbestos and non-asbestos, and to put that into the record. Mike is right. We are understanding a lot more about how asbestos and other uh, workplace exposure to gases, to other dust such as silica, and other toxic agents cause COPD. But very important to take the history and then put the history right there beside the disease so everybody knows.